had this really old German teacher. Uh, what school were you in? I was at University of Ottawa. Uh huh. And um, he'd be like, "Oh, well, you must take the, you know, the little, the the rubber policeman was the name of it." Anyway, but we, he was just really obsessed with having us learn how to crystallize things in a pure way and and getting. You could tell how pure something was by the melting point too, because if it has a sharp, very defined, narrow range melting point, that means it's really pure. Hmm. But now, of course, we can inject it onto an HPLC and see, um, you know, the whole spectrum of, of impurities. But um, can you untangle the acronym there? HPLC is oh, a... um, high uh, high performance or high pressure liquid chromatography, hmm. and so you can use that as an analytical method or as a purification method. But hmm. it's kind of a black box, which is why I prefer doing sort of more hands-on purification techniques. Um, I don't like the idea of just shooting my compound into something and then seeing it disappear into the, into, into the, <laughs> into the waste barrel, the large 20 <laughs> liter waste barrel. So That's you said they fun. don't teach this anymore? No, no. How come? Because the HPLC is there and so people just yeah, rely on it? Yeah, the HPLC is there. People just rely on that. Um, people, you know, it's, it's faster maybe sometimes to, to just to just throw it down an automated prep purification system. But like if you're making a batch for uh, animal tox, you need, you need it to be as pure as possible because you don't want to see some sort of toxic side effect from an impurity in the material and not, not know whether it's the, an impurity or the actual compound. So you need to get it ultra, ultra pure in a large scale. And the best way to do that is is crystallization and then you get a uniform batch and then also the crystalline form is more stable for um you know reproducibility so that you know if you make a batch you can you can do x-ray powder diffraction to see what kind of crystal form it is whether it's sort of like this type of form or this kind of form or you know like there's different there's different ways that the crystals can form and um, so you want that to be reproducible because when you submit to the FDA, you actually specify which crystal form you're using. And uh -huh. um, yeah, <laughs> so, so that's also why my skills come in handy because then when we're doing the final stuff, then you need to, you need to have someone be able to make a reproducible crystal form. So you said the old story was that the, the chemist would scratch their beard and get some... To, to, <laughs> yeah, the to old German the... chemist would like scratch their beards to seed the flask. And I would say, well, I, I don't have a beard, but I can, you know, because there weren't very many gals in the lab <laughs> when I was starting out. So I'd be like, I'll just toss my hair. <laughs> so there was a, lot, a tiny bit of um, dust Fluff, or dandruff yeah. or something. And it would... Or sometimes I'll just blow across of it. And that will so this is an open it. flask of some kind and a tiny bit of something would fall in a, into the yeah. solution and somehow the well, then molecules it would, just, would like catch on to that yeah and yeah say, oh we'll build on this so yeah like, yeah this kind of acts like a nucleus for the for the crystallization or you could scratch across the across the glass of like the super saturated solution and you'll see crystals form where you've scratched when you're scratching down through the liquid to scratch the glass yeah 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 like you use a metal spatula down in, inside the flask oh, inside okay. the flask yeah, i mean you use a really clean spatula right <laughs> but it's just like um yeah if you have a brand new flask stuff won't crystallize as well as if you have like kind of a beat up flask that's got some scratches and if you put a new a new scratch then those little imperfections in the glass surface allow crystals to form i remember that from boiling you boiling chips are rough and, exactly. and whatever, so yeah. because the boiling begins uh, on a surface that's irregular and has um, fo foci of heat or whatever. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, it's not so much that, but it, it, it's where the yes, kind of. <laughs> it gets it gets the process started. It gets the process started, right? It allows sort of the the bubbles of gas to nucleate. Okay. It's like when you have something in the microwave, so you can, sometimes you boil a cup of water in the microwave and it will be above the boiling point of the water. And then you move the mug and suddenly it boils over and people get a burn. Yeah, that's called superheated, right? Right, so the same thing is like, you just need somewhere for it to nucleate. So some people take like one grain of salt out of the salt shaker and drop it in, which would- I would do the trick. Give it enough, yeah. Yeah. Just one thing that's not 
just the pure porcelain surface inside the vessel. Yeah, exactly. Now you were saying you use a column originally to purify things, but if they were only like you were saying 75% pure, you'd recrystallize in a number of stages. Well, a column a column chromatography is is one way of purifying um, using silica gel. The HPLC is uh, sort of a very specialized um, kind of column. And that it's a kind of a variation. Ultimately, it's a variation on the on the silica gel col column chromatography. The crystallization is just a it's just a different it's a different mode of purification. And so yeah, so a lot of times you'll have something that's like maybe you know sixty percent pure or forty percent pure, even coming off of a reaction. You know, you're crude. It'll look like a brown. Uh, sludgy kind of mess and so then you would maybe do an initial rough kind of trituration uh, um, or crystallization to get it to like 60% pure then you filter it then you take those 60% pure crystals and do them again and then probably get up to 85 or 90 and then maybe one more to get to the you know 99 95 so when you say do them again you you put them in a flask and you put them in fresh in clean solvent. solvent right and you'll see them becoming less brown and sludgy and it'll become quite light in color and then sometimes you'll see the actual um, crystal you know if it's nice plates or something like that or needles you'll see them forming the trituration is where so usually for a formal crystallization you fully dissolve and then let it slowly come out of solution but a trituration you would take um, sort of a hot solution and just sort of swirl it up and so you get partly dissolved, partly undissolved, and there's kind of an equilibrium between dissolving and coming out of solution. So sometimes the trituration is the best thing because you, you know, you're sort of trading off, you know, how much time you're spending on the crystallization. Um, you know, sometimes you just want to quick, you know, get it to 80% pure or whatever. Um, so there's like less solvent involved. It's less fussy when you do the trituration type of thing. A lot of times I'll just put the solvent in, put it on the rotor vat, heat it and spin it at the same time or heat it and stir it and, um, and then filter it after I come back from lunch. And, uh, you know, then the material is like, you know, 85% pure, which is, you know, good enough to go on to the next reaction. So mm. that's, but it's, it's a lost art. It's the people, they don't teach it in school anymore. They don't, um. So I've been trying to pass it along to, you know, anybody who has... Now, you were saying at one patients. point that you start the crystallization by blowing, literally blowing across the surface of the liquid. And sometimes, yeah, just that little bit of, you know, ripple or um, slightly more evaporation or cooling of the surface because you have a hot solution generally. And so that little bit of, of cooling, that temperature difference or something, or the will enable the crystallization to start. Or sometimes even just turning the flask slowly, and it'll like run into like a, a an old scratch in the flask, and that will start to crystallize and come out solution. So. So this goes on slowly. It's like you see them start, and then you know it's going to be a while. Well, yeah, yeah. People joke about leaving leaving something at the back of the hood for the weekend or go away for a week and then come back and they have crystals. <laughs> um, sometimes if it just comes out really fast from solution, it's not as pure. It, um, so, it, you know. And why does that happen? You told me something. Yeah, you get inclusions. So, so you can imagine if you've got crystals forming like this, they could trap an impurity in between them. Um, and if they grow yeah. faster, that's more likely to happen. Yeah, yeah, so that is more likely to happen. Or if the crystals are kind of, yeah, they grow quickly or if they're kind of big and clumpy. Whereas if you um, do very slowly, like a lot of times I'll, I'll very, very slowly reduce the temperature, um, like even deliberately heating and then just very slowly reducing the temperature so that it just comes out of solution um, really slowly. So if you have the big clumpy ones, you're, you're not lost. You actually can um, filter them out. Oh yeah, you never throw out anything. So when you filter, you don't toss the filtrate. Never. <laughs> uh, a lot of times, you know, you'll keep the filtrate in, in the back of the hood. And then sometimes I'll even take a few combined filtrates and do another crystallization and get another crop out from that. Mm. Um, so, you know, as, no molecule is left behind. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. So you, and sometimes you get seed crystals forming in there. Um, and, you, you know, you can do different assays to um, assess you know, the purity of the different crystal batches. Um, 
So to do the assay, you don't have to put the entire batch into the machine. You oh just gosh. take a little sample and test it to see yeah. what you got and yeah, assume you... the rest is the yeah, same. Yeah, you try to take a representative thing. You don't, you know, obviously take the lightest color crystal in the batch. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, right. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, you, you try to, you know, take a, a mixed. So they'd come out different colors. The, the, the batch would be sort of motley or... Sometimes as you're filtering it, so you're supposed to rinse the crystals as you filter, mm -hmm. right? So so some part might get more rinsed, or sometimes the ones on the upper edges of the filter funnel might get a little more rinsing than the ones in the main bed of crystals. So when you're assessing the purity, you know, you want to mix everything and, and you know, properly take a sample. So what was the reaction you got from people in your lab? Not naming names, of course, but what what did they say to you when you were doing this kind of thing? I mean, a lot of the people there are younger than you are by now, right? Yeah, well, they're like, they're like, I don't have the patience for this, you know, I can't take too long, it's, you know, too fussy, and then I, I will get it to work. And, but it's it's needed, you know, so that, you know, you have the the, the, the good crystals for the <laughs> Sorry, you, no, have, okay. you have a good crystal crystals uh, for the final pharmaceutical form, and um, sometimes you need the you need it to be in a crystalline form, and um, they they're just like. So they How come, did you do it? She's the crystal god, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they come and ask you for help. They come and ask me for help. Yeah. Well, I I, I actually even. Like, so my coworker was trying to get things to crystallize. So I, I gave him a bunch of coaching because we're, I'm working you know, from home now and, but he's in the lab. So I was giving him a bunch of coaching on, you know, what to do, heat it up, let it cool, heat it up, let it cool. And then felt like, let it slowly come out of solution. And then he was like, well, how do I know if they're crystalline? Cause sometimes you can look at something and you can see it's like shiny or needles and yeah, it's a crystal, but okay. sometimes it looks, it looks like just like a powder. And so um, we have a polarized light microscope, and um, if it's crystalline, it has this sort of thing called birefringence. It's kind of like a rainbow colors um, that you observe when you look at the at the material under the microscope with the polarized light. Mm. And so he was looking at it, and I said, "Well, you know, here's how to make the slide and put it under the microscope." And he's like, "I don't know what I'm looking at here." So I'm like, he managed to hold up his iPhone. <laughs> to the microscope <laughs> thing and send it. We did a FaceTime and he held it up and I'm like, yes, those are crystals. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, our, our mutual supervisor was delighted that we were able to use technology in that way. <laughs> then, yeah, she highlighted it at, at our group meeting. <laughs> so, <laughs> Crystalline chemistry. chemistry during the pandemic. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're, um, so you've done that for a number of years and, um, Oh yeah, I've been crystallizing to... things since what, 87, 87. Yeah. When I started, uh, undergrad. So, oh wow. Yeah. That's a lot of crystals, <laughs> <laughs> but I did a lot because when I was working in agricultural chemistry, you don't want to do fancy sort of, or, uh, labor intensive and, um, uh, Column chromatography is expensive because you're using a lot of solvents and you're using a highly purified form of silica, which is you know essentially sand, but it's it's highly uniform and expensive. So um, doing crystallization, you can purify large amounts um, very inexpensively because if you're putting, imagine if you're putting some compound on like a field of corn, um, you, can, you can't be spending crazy amounts of money. Not the same as if you're making a cancer drug where you just need like a few milligrams to treat one patient. So. Oh, as, as an under test. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the, the tests of new compounds that we make now in um, pharmaceutical chemistry um, are just literally like 0.1 meg is all you would need to do a cellular assay. And a meg is a milligram? Oh, yeah, a milligram. So you're talking about a tenth of a milligram? Very, very little is needed. I yeah. mean, usually we request a milligram so that... Um, we send a milligram over to the biologists and that's enough for them to do tons of assays. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because they just make a very dilute solution. They make a make a very dilute solution. I mean, we we have stock solutions of um, a lot of the compounds in our compound library. And then, I mean, all the pharmaceutical companies do this. They have 
they have their compound libraries and just a very, very small amount, um, fractions of a milligram are needed to, to run an assay.